hotel is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. Godtel is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. Godtel is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. Godtel is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on in God tell. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 25. <laughs> Advice to the unmarried. <clears throat> This will be the last in this series on marriage. <clears throat> some of you, <clears throat> excuse me, some of you are probably wondering why you need to hear this because you've already screwed up your life and uh, messed up your relationships and you don't have them anymore. That's obvious. Well, hopefully, maybe if you listen next time around, if you have a next time around, you won't make the same mistakes. If you do, shame on you. There's no reason for it. Everything you need to know for a successful marriage is in the Word of God. If you do it God's way, you will have a successful marriage. If you don't and you're selfish and greedy and you want what you want, then your marriage is doomed to fail. Starting in verse 25, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. Yet I give my judgment as one that has obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Are you bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But, and if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, and I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remains that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cares for the things of the world and how he might please his wife. And there is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is calmly and that which may attend upon the Lord without, that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. But if any man think that he behaves himself uncalmly toward his virgin, if she pass a flower of her age and the needs so require, let them do what, let him do what he will. He sins not, let them marry. Nevertheless, he that stands fast in his heart having no necessity but has power over his own will and has so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin does well. So that he that gives her in marriage does well, but he that gives her not in marriage doeth better. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also I have the Spirit of God. Well, let's go back to verse 25. Now concerning virgins or those that are unmarried. Now Paul writes this in such a way because he doesn't want you to think of him as being a know-it-all. He knew what the Lord said. This is God's word, all of it. But he didn't have any practical experience because he'd never been married. So even though he wanted to tell the people 
and the Christians that he's writing to what the Lord says. He didn't want to do it in such a way that he came off as a person that knew everything because he had no experience with marriage. And that's why it's unwise to go to a Catholic priest for marriage counseling. They have no idea what they're talking about. They've never been married, so they can't know what they're talking about. So Paul wanted us to understand that. So he says, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment, or my assessment, as one that has obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. He says, I have a relationship with the Lord, and in my relationship, you will find that I am faithful. And because of that, the Lord has trusted him with the word that these people needed to hear, that you need to hear. I suppose, therefore, that it is good for the present distress, the hard times. I say that it is good for a man to be so. Now he's talking about the previous part of the chapter where he talked about that it's better if a man remains single or a woman, for that matter, so they could serve the Lord without distractions. It's good to be this way, to stay single. Are you bound to a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Make the best of it. Are you loosed from a wife? The word bound there means shackled. It's where we get the phrase ball and chain. You know, we talk about our wives being the old ball and chain. I don't talk about my wife that way except when she's not around. <laughs> do you seek, uh, do you seek not, a, if you're not, if you're loose from a wife, don't seek a wife. Now, I remember when I got saved back in 1972, uh, my first wife had run off with my best friend, left me with a, my oldest son to take care of, which lives in, here in Texas now. And uh, I took care of him. He's now 51, so it's been a good while ago. And uh, I, I'm, I'm one of these people that I can't be single. I, I just can't. i got to have somebody, you know. That's just me. Some people have a gift to be single. Some people don't. I don't have it. And so I was probably in three or four different relationships before I met Nancy. And they all bombed. No, nothing worked right like it should. And then one day, as I was reading the Word of God, I made a choice. I made a decision that I would stay single the rest of my life if that's what God wanted me to do. And I would just concentrate on the Lord and my boy, Michael. And so I was doing that, and it, I don't know how long it was after that. It wasn't very long, a few weeks, maybe a month, I don't know, two months, that God brought Nancy across my path. I've never seen her before. Didn't know that redheads existed, wasn't worried about it. <laughs> I just wasn't looking for a wife, but I looked up and saw Nancy, and the Lord said, that's the woman you're going to marry. And so I followed her home and knocked on her door. She opened the door. I said, hi, would you marry me? I didn't even tell her my name, just hi, would you marry me? She laughed really hard. She thought that was the funniest thing she ever heard. And, of course, she said no. And I said, but, you know, you're the one that God says you're going to marry me. I know, I'm going to... I'm going to Dallas to further my education. I'm going to make lots of money. And blah, da, 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 da. I said, no, you're going to marry me. We, we got married when we knew each other 12 days. We went to a church service. We never dated, but we went to church together. And we were sitting there, and the pastor, the preacher, the evangelist, started speaking. And when he quoted some scripture to us, looking right at us, we knew. Nancy looked at me and she knew she wasn't going to school. She knows that she was going to get married and be my secretary. I didn't care if she could even cook. I didn't care. As long as she could type. You can do without the cooking if you can type. That's one thing you got to learn. And uh, so she's been my secretary all these years. And my wife, my number one squeeze, my only squeeze, I don't even like I don't even like recreational, recreational hugging. Boy, well, we went through a stage in our church in the 1980s. Everybody was hugging each other, you know. And then women would come up, try to hug me. I said, "Go away, hug your husband, leave me alone. I'll hug my wife if I want to hug." And I didn't like the men hugging me either. And of course, today you got to be really careful about that. So, I, I, I suppose it's best if you just stay single, but. 
If you have a wife, you don't get unmarried. Stay that way. If you marry because you need to, well, you haven't sinned. If a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, he says, I want to spare you because you're going to have trouble in this life. Let me tell you a secret. I really love my wife, I do. But having a wife never solved any of my problems. It created new problems I didn't even know existed. We have six children. Six children never solved any of my problems. Created six new problems I didn't know about before. When the last one moved out of the house, Josh, we love you, but we were so happy. <laughs> and uh, we were really happy when he got married because then we knew he wouldn't be coming back. <laughs> His wife will keep him over there, and that's a good thing. <laughs> And there was a couple of our boys that we wanted to put back from where they came from, but Nancy wouldn't go for that. <laughs> oh, we love all our children, seriously, but it never solved our problems. I got 14 grandchildren, that never solved a problem. Four great grandchildren, that never solved a problem. It created new problems. The secret is this everything you obtain in your life from without, from outside of your own self, never solves any problems. It creates new problems. The guy was telling me one time, he says, I need to find a job. I said, why? He said, well, i got to make some money. I said, why? He said, why do you keep saying why? I said, well, what are you going to do with the money when you get it? You don't know how to spend it. That's why you ended up at Godtell. So what difference does it make if you have any? He had never thought about that. I said, you see, the problem is you go get a job, and all of a sudden now you have a responsibility to be there on time, which you never had that responsibility before. you got to obey what your boss tells you to do or you lose your job. You never had that problem before. And then on Friday they give you a paycheck and you're looking at it and you got to figure out what to do with it. You never thought about that. You know, you got certain bills. you got to pay your bills. I understand that. But, uh, you know, most people then misspend the rest. I was talking to a man the other day that was a, some type of engineer and he made lots of money in his life, but he doesn't have a dime. He spent it all. You know, making $80,000 a year and spending it all. You know? People do that. God tells full of people that have been working all their lives and have nothing to show for it. They didn't know what to do with it. They never really considered, what should I do with this money? Oh, I know, I'm going to go buy me a carton of cigarettes. I'm going to go get me a 12-pack of beer. If you're smart, you won't be buying drugs. Of course, if you're smart, you wouldn't be buying the beer or the cigarettes either. I've had to bury a lot of people that have, you know, and, and I've, these people come along, it'll never happen to me. I'll never get cancer. I don't know how many times I've talked to people that said that, and then I had to bury them. And a lot of them died in their 50s, died young, you know. And cirrhosis of the liver. Well, Brother June, you don't know what you're talking about. I had an aunt, and she lived to be 115 and smoked 40 packs of cigarettes a day. Well, she might have lived to be 150, for all you know, if she hadn't done that. I mean, those anecdotes sound nice to hear them, but they're few and far between. Most people, they die young. I was mad after my this heart attack I had in November. And when we got to the mission at Nacogdoches after I got out of the hospital, one of the guys came, that works for me came over to help us get our stuff out of the truck. And I looked at him and I said, I don't like you. I hate you. And he looked at me and he says, why do you hate me? I said, because you smoke and I get the heart attack. <laughs> Think about that. Of course, I don't really hate him, but, you know, I'm just trying to get his attention. He's still smoking. <clears throat> I had a guy this week in Nacogdoches was complaining about he just had a heart attack and a blah, 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 blah. And he was smoking while he was talking to me. And I looked at him and I said, I don't feel sorry for you. I said, I might if you'd quit smoking. Of course, the classic answer, I've tried. I said, no, you didn't. Because you don't try to quit smoking. You either quit or you don't. And all these people always tell me, oh, I'm down to half a pack. What in the world does that mean? It means you're still smoking. That's what it means. 
Uh, they don't want to hear it, though. And I, t I told the guy, I said, if, if you drop dead, I'm not going to feel sorry for you. In fact, I told everybody this morning at Bible study, I said, you know what? Some of you are going to die from cigarettes, alcohol, whatever. I said, I'm going to tell you what, if I'm around when it happens, as soon as they put the dirt over the top of your casket, I'm going to go over there and yell at you and tell you, I told you so. <laughs> I've done that. Of course, I do it when nobody's around because I don't want them to think I'm crazy. <clears throat> And I'm trying to spare you, he says. Everything we tell you to warn you, we're trying to help you, we're trying to spare you. This I say, brethren, the time is short. It remains that both they that have wives have, act like they don't have one. Be as though they didn't have one. Well, he's not talking about getting rid of your wife. He's talking about putting God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. It's time. Time to make some changes. Time to become a doer of the word of God, James 1.22. Put God first. Jesus said it this way. He said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to hate your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your aunt, your uncle, Betty Sue, your cousin, all the rest of them. And he's talking about in comparison to him. That means put him first. But most people don't want to do that. I was talking to a guy that's a manager of a restaurant, and he, we were talking about obedience to God. And he says, I don't need to obey God. I need to obey my wife. I felt so sorry for that guy. And then I met his wife, and then I found out why. She beat him up. I've seen women do that. Yeah, some women are tough. My wife, she's tough, but not that tough. And those that weep as though they didn't weep. Those that rejoice as though they didn't rejoice. Those that own things and possessing as though they didn't possess it. And not abusing the world. Why? Because it's passing away. In 1 John it says, If you love the world, the love of God is not in you. There is nothing in this world that has any real value. It's all oh, there's gold out there in them hills. Yeah, and God uses it for pavement. Think about that. We walk on gold in heaven. It's just, it's just like gravel. It's not important. But I would have you without carefulness. That means no worries. A person that's unmarried, he cares for the Lord. And I've met people like this that knew that God did not want them to be married. And all they did was spend their time like Apostle Paul, trying to please God. That's all they wanted to do. My greatest desire is that when I stand before Jesus on Judgment Day, that he smiles and says, well done. I don't want him to look at me and say, oh, it's you. Come on in. You know? And that's what he's going to do with some people. He's going to say, well, you barely made it. And he that's married cares for the things of the world. I know that. You're trying to figure out how to please your wife because you know what they say. Happy wife, happy life. I want my wife to be happy, especially those grouchy mornings when she gets up and starts talking to me in her sweet, melodious voice. Get out of bed! <laughs> okay. I told her the other day, I said, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to get up. She says, you got to. I said, why do I got to? She said, because you're the pastor. Oh, <laughs> forgot. <laughs> There's a difference between a wife and a virgin. That's a married woman and an unmarried woman. The unmarried woman, she cares about the Lord. She's focused. The married woman's not. Her love is divided. She wants to please her husband. My wife tries to please me. She tries really hard, which since my heart attack, it's kind of been weird. I had to change my diet. Everything that tastes good, I have to spit out. <laughs> Some of you don't have a sense of humor, I can tell. 
And, uh, but I had to quit eating a lot of candy and uh, I had to quit eating anything with trans fats, saturated fats. Uh, and, and, you know, the list goes on and on. No more white bread. Now she's telling me rice is no good for me. It turns into sugar, white rice. I had spaghetti tonight for dinner. I shouldn't have had that, but I enjoyed it. I love spaghetti. It's like eating worms, and I love it. <laughs> The other day, she's going to the store. I said, honey, would you bring me a little package of double bubble bubble gum? Because I can chew it, you know, I don't have to eat it. Especially when we go walking, I like to have something in my mouth. My wife, she, she, she did, she did. She went and got me some double bubble gum. She came home with a bucket. With 300 pieces of bubble gum in it. I said, honey, I just wanted a little package of gum. They bring me 300. She says, well, that's only about a couple of months. I said, no, wait a minute. 300 pieces, I eat one a day. That's going to take me almost a whole year to eat. It'll be hard and spoiled before I get to finish it. I know she was trying to please me, but she goes a little overboard. I've told her, you know, will you get me one? And she comes back with 10 or 300. <clears throat> the wife's trying to please her husband. So her devotion is divided. A person who is unmarried can serve the Lord without, as it says here in verse 35, without distraction, unless they decide to become a busybody and a tail bearer and a gossip. And you know, that's what happens to some women that are not married and some men. Well, men don't gossip, but the women do, they gossip. Men don't gossip, y'all do know that, don't you? <laughs> Everything we say about our neighbors is true. <laughs> no sense of humor. Where's my laugh sign? Oh, here it is. <laughs> And, and, and I've seen this happen with some women, they, their husband passes away or something, and next thing you know, they're busy by running all over town telling everybody everything. <sighs> Shouldn't be that way. If they're Christians, they ought to be serving the Lord and doing it without distraction. <clears throat> to help, he says in verse 35, I've told you this to help you, not to cast a snare upon you. That means to help you and not burden you. Get to work. Work for Jesus. But if any man think that he behaves himself uncommonly, that means unseemly or improperly, toward his virgin, his girlfriend, his betrothed, his marriage that was arranged for him, and I've told people they don't get this, but in the old days, these people never saw who they were going to marry until the day of their marriage, of their wedding. It was prearranged when they were little kids. Sometimes they'd caught a glimpse of them, saw them somewhere, but most of the time they didn't even see them. And those marriages would last till the end of their lives. 60, 70 years later, they're still married because these people got married when they were what we call teenagers. But a, a man was a man at age 12 back in those days. A woman was a woman around 12, 13 years old. They were taught their responsibilities. They were taught how to react and act with a husband or a wife. We're not taught that, you know what we're taught? We're taught how to accept transgenders from kindergarten with crayon books. They've got them in the schools. And they use crayons, different colored crayons, to show how that different colors have to be accepted. And it's about transgenderism. That's what we're doing. We're not teaching kids how to, ha how to be successful in a relationship. <clears throat> so if this woman has no necessity to be married and if the boyfriend the fiance if you want to, in our terms no necessity for marriage then let them stay single now that's referring to sex There's no if you can control yourself a lot of people can't so it's better to marry 
Let them do what they will. They don't sin. Let them marry. But if a person can have no necessity, have power over his own will, and decreed in his heart to keep his virgin a virgin, then stay that way. And not too many people have that gift. So he that, talking about daddy now, he that gives her in marriage does well, and he that gives her not in marriage, he does even better. The wife is bound or shackled by the law as long as her husband lives. God hates divorce. There's only one reason God ever gave for a divorce, and that was infidelity. One or the other partners committing adultery. That's the only legitimate reason you have for a divorce. There are no other excuses. In the Bible, we talked about this already in the previous part of the chapter. It said if a woman leaves her husband, maybe she needs to leave him, maybe he's beating her up, something, or maybe somebody, but she's supposed to stay unmarried and to be reconciled to her husband when he gets straightened out. Pray for him. We don't do that anymore either. In fact, it's really sad because, and I, I don't like marriages anymore. I don't like doing weddings because most of the people don't stay married very long, a few months, a year, you know. And then they come in, they, they don't even really want counseling. They'll come in to make a show of it. And uh, they don't really want to know what they're supposed to be doing. They've already decided, I'm not going to stay with this person. One woman came in, wanted to divorce her husband because he was boring. That's what he said. He was boring. I said, where in the Bible does it say you can divorce your husband if he's boring? And he was a good husband. Worked, took care of business, took care of the kids, never beat her up, not, nothing. Just always treated her good. She told me that. But he was boring. She wanted some excitement in her life. She found it. And it did not work out very well. Most people have no idea when they have it well off. So they go looking for something else. And it's a big illusion. You know what a lot of people are doing now? Internet dating. And that is turning into a disaster. I've got two or three people up in Nacogdoches. One guy just got his heart broken and his pocketbook emptied. He was online carrying on a relationship with a woman in Germany. And I told them all, I said, you know, folks, the minute they ask you for money, there's something wrong. All my life I've dated, and I never had any woman ask me for money. I've had a few give me some, because I'm so good looking, or I was. And this one guy... He got his heart broken. He was sending money to her regularly, and finally he lost his job. And once he lost his job, she didn't talk to him anymore. She got everything out of him she could. This other girl, I feel sorry for her. She's not a very good-looking girl. And she's got online with this guy in Arizona or Utah, Utah, that uh, is, looks like a rock star, like a movie star. And she can't figure it out. And she's been sending him money. It's just a con game. Who knows how many people they're spending all day long on the computer talking to and getting money out of. Because they tell you everything you want to hear. Jesus said, beware when all men speak well of you. Watch out when they tell you what you want to hear. Because there's something afoot. I always wanted to say that. There's something amiss. Something is not right. You need to be careful because they will drain you. And when they're done draining you, they go on to somebody else. There's a lot of con people out there. The reason is because they found out that it's easier to con people than it is to hold a real job. I know, I used to do that. And if I was still doing what I was doing before I got saved, I'd have anything you have. And with a smile on my face and a twinkle in my eye. <clears throat> Nevertheless, if you can do without, then do it. Self-control. 
But if you can't and you have a fiance, get married. It's okay. <laughs> Only in the Lord. If we're talking to Christians, if you're not a Christian, none of this really matters much. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband is dead, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will. Only in the Lord. She's a Christian. She's only supposed to marry another Christian. If the man's a Christian, he's only supposed to marry another Christian. In fact, that almost put the kaidas on my wife and I. When I, I found out, the first day I met her, I found out she wasn't a Christian. And I said, Lord, I can't marry her. She's not a Christian. Well, I knew what the Bible said. And all the Lord would say to me was, that's the woman you're going to marry. So I held her down and beat her up. <laughs> made her accept Jesus. No. I talked to her about the Lord Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And Wednesday afternoon she got saved. And the next week we got married. By the way, folks, let me tell you how it goes. We got people in other countries that never see their potential husband or wife till the day they get married and they never get a divorce. We've got people that spend five years dating and they stay married six months. Dating's not all it's cracked up to be. It's a big waste of time because those people are taught that you learn to love. It's, love's nothing to do with feelings. It's, a, it's a, a choice you make to do what you're supposed to do for that other person. Seeing what the needs are. Meeting those needs. But as you do that and you grow together, then the feeling of love comes. It's really easy for me to my wife to tell you that the first couple of years, we had no real feeling about love. Our marriage was like anybody else's, except for the fact that we had decided when we got married that we would do it God's way. And there was a lot of painful nights and days because we were miserable, but we were determined to do it God's way. And as we did that, the Lord caused us to fall in love with each other, like you're supposed to. But love is something you have to learn. If you get married on a feeling, you're going to get divorced on a feeling. Well, i got to get out of here. I'm going to kill this other person. And you won't even call them a significant other at that point. You'll be looking at them and say they're going to be a dead other. But, he says... In my estimation, she'd be happier if she just stayed single. And he's, this refers to men and women, both. Now, the Bible's very plain, and, and Paul says it. He says, I have the Spirit of God. So he knew what he was talking about. And he's the one that wrote almost all of the uh, words of exhortation and commandment about husbands and wives. In 1 Timothy and Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5 is a classic more preachers have used that at weddings than probably any other passage. It says, for the husbands to love their wives like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Unselfishly. He gave himself for the church. And the men are supposed to give themselves for the wife. Most men are too sorry and lazy to do that. Of course, I know it's none of you. It's the people who were here last week. They're all gone. We don't want to do that. We got to, I, I ain't going to miss the big game for you. It's a good thing for my wife that I don't like football or basketball or bowling or baseball or golf, especially golf. Ooh. I've never understood that game. Why would you want to beat up a perfectly good little white ball that never did anything to you Knock it as far as you can and then go out and look for it. I don't know why you'd want to do that. I used to tell my grandkids, uh, we, we have a lot of golf clubs donated to the missions, especially in Livingston and Balls. And so I would go out in the backyard with a driver, and we have woods right behind our house, and I would hit those golf balls as far hard as I could have. And you'd hear them ping pong off the trees, you know, it was kind of funny. And then after I got done hitting a bucket of balls out there, I went in the house. And then when the grandkids came over, I gave them a job to do. I'd go out there and look for those golf balls. 
I did. And they come back and bring me the golf balls, all happy, you know, wide-eyed, you know, oh, Grandpa, I found five. He only found four. Ah. And I'd take the balls, and after they were gone, I'd knock them back out in the woods. <laughs> I loved it. That's as close to playing golf as I want to ever get. And football doesn't make much sense to me. You got 22 men chasing a little piece of pig on 100 yards of green grass. That does not make sense. But that's what they do. And most of them can't even write their name, and yet we pay them millions of dollars. Well, I don't. They ain't getting none of my money. Somebody asked me one day, Brother June, you want to go watch the Dallas Cowboys play? I said, no. They said, don't you like the Dallas Cowboys? I said, no. They said, well, what do you like? I said, the cow I like the cowgirls pretty well, but I don't like the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> of course, that was a joke. And you should have that point going, ha, 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 ha. But I can see that it's getting late and it's past your bedtime. If you want to have a successful relationship, the answer is very simple. You're going to have to do it God's way. If you're not going to do it God's way, you'd be better off staying single because all you're going to do is be a statistic and ruin another relationship. That's all you're going to do. And then there's all these kids out there being raised without two parents. That's going to destroy our country. Kids out there being raised by their grandparents, uncles, aunts, aunts, strangers, foster care. That's going to destroy our nation. We got a whole generation of kids coming up like that. They have no idea who their daddy was. I met a girl one time, we were checking her into mission. She had five kids. Every child had a different last name. And I guarantee you, not one of those daddies ever came to visit those kids. They weren't interested in them. And the mama had no skills. She had no way to support those kids. The best thing that could happen to her is find some man that would love her and take care of those kids. But that ain't going to happen. How many men want to jump up for that job? Yeah, me. I've been looking for a woman with five kids from five different men. Yeah. So in all likelihood, all she's ever going to do is be able to collect welfare checks. And that's fixing to stop. Maybe sooner than I suspect. Because uh, next month, if the government doesn't come to terms on their thing with Donald Trump, the Social Security checks, not Social Security, the welfare checks, that's first, are going to st there won't be any welfare checks next month. And then the Social Security checks will be after that. And I'm looking forward to it as I kill the whole thing. Because that's what we need. That's about the only thing to get our attention. We haven't learned that the government doesn't owe us a living. Doesn't owe us anything. We owe it. And we ought to be grateful that we live here instead of in China or Iran or Iraq. You know what they got in Iraq and Iran, don't you? Plenty of sand. They got lots of sand. Father, we thank you for loving us. And I do thank you for each one in the room. I just hope they're listening because come Judgment Day, I know that everyone in this room is going to be held accountable for what was said tonight. And I know some of them would like to have relationships worth having, but they're not going to find those relationships until they commit to you, until they surrender to our Lord and trust Jesus. We know they can because you've given us the ability to make choices. The problem is that most of us for too long have made wrong choices. We thank you for your word. It lets us know everything we need to know. We thank you for the salvation you've offered us. It's free. We thank you that Jesus was willing to die and pay the penalty for our sin raised from the dead and promised to return and looking at the news, and looking at the Bible, we know it's getting really close. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.